I have the privilege of introducing a special guest on this channel. His name is Shane Reed. And for those that don't know Shane, Shane has 100 trials under his belt. He's an advocacy coach and professor, and he's also a best-selling author when it comes to books for lawyers. For example, Shane wrote Winning at Deposition, Winning at Cross-Examination, Winning at Persuasion for Lawyers, and this bad boy right here, Turning Points at Trial. So boil down, Shane is the ideal guest for this Law Venture community. So I'm excited to share with you all the insights that he provides in this interview. But before we dive into episode one of this interview series, a few quick things I need to note. One, whenever you go in the description, you'll see links to the resources and Shane's books down below. Two, if you wanna reach out to Shane or go to his website, I'll provide links down below as well. And three, if you're enjoying the insights from Shane and the tips and tricks that he provides throughout this episode series, be sure to hit the like button. Doing so allows videos like this to rank higher so we can reach more people and help more people. That's always the goal. It helps make the algorithm happy. Now, with all of that said, let's dive into the interview. I hope you enjoy. So with me, I have Shane Reed in Law Venture. This one is something I've been looking forward to, and I know you've been looking forward to because Shane is here to drop some knowledge bombs. Shane, thank you for being here. Hey, Jared, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Shane, a little bit of background and context for you and the Law Venture community. I have your, I have your book back here. Winning at Deposition. This is one of the first books I bought as soon as I got licensed as a lawyer because I had no idea how to conduct and do a deposition. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I had trial experience, but not deposition experience. And so this book was a great how-to deposition 101 and then how to elevate my deposition as well. So do you mind if we dive into the deposition topic? Sure, that'd be great. Okay, can you explain the importance of depositions? When I'm talking to lawyers, I often ask them this somewhat of a trick question. I ask them when their next trial is, and they'll mm -hmm. think, well, it's in a few months or uh, next year. Then I'll ask them, when is your next deposition? They say, well, it's next week. And then I tell them that your next trial really is your next deposition because Deposition testimony now is trial testimony just because the odds are, as studies have shown, that only 8% of our civil trials or civil cases are going to trial. Your deposition is the trial. It is the testimony that will affect the settlement, whether it's through mediation or on your own negotiations or summary judgment. Depositions are everything now. And they're much imp more important than they used to be just based on those statistics that I just shared with you. Okay. So if depositions are so important, then what is the deposition strategy that you like to use? In particular, what's your persona? What's your style whenever you are taking that deposition? I guess there are two different answers to that question. The, as far as style, my personality is genuine, which everyone should be, but I want to be Prepared, polite, and respectful, and firm. If you can do those four things, you're really in command of the deposition. If you're prepared, obviously, be polite with the witness and the opposing counsel. Be respectful of the answers, but firm in knowing that you're going to get the answer to the simple questions that you ask. And you're not going to leave that deposition until you get those answers. And you can do all the, those four things together. And that's really a good attitude. I, I can't remember the other part of your question, but I think I was going to answer it is you need to be really prepared mm -hmm. and know what you want out of the deposition just because they're so important. Is that a difficult line for lawyers to walk in general when it comes to you know maintaining that professional persona? when maybe they have a combatant wit witness and they have a stubborn lawyer on the other side who's objecting to anything and everything? I think it's hard for any human being, right? When you are being reasonable mm -hmm. and the other person or witness or the other lawyer is not, who wouldn't lose their patience, get angry, get frustrated, lose their concentration, all those emotions that are very natural. 
one way to avoid that is to, if you know it's going to be a difficult attorney or difficult witness, just think about beforehand, before you go to that deposition, spend about 10 minutes and just do some visualization, picturing yourself being focused and calm and not reacting. And that way, when it happens, you go, okay, I've already thought about this a little bit. I've thought how I'm going to get through this by being persistent, but also being polite. Yes, it's hard. But if we all went to law school, we, we've got this higher education and skill set to be able to work through some of these problems, even though they're emotional ones. So you just have to overcome it and be, and be aware of it. In my experience, the most common situation where I have another lawyer who's getting frustrated or is clearly frazzled to some extent is typically in the deposition context. And the irony for me is that when I get that sense, I'm actually calmed by it. I'm comforted by it because I realize, oh, maybe I'm starting to press on a, on a pressure point there. I like that, Jared. And that's all about being aware of your surroundings and looking for those cues, which really aren't that hard to find. You just have to be aware of them. And you'll sense it from the witness, from the lawyer. He'll, he or she will start objecting more. The witness gets a little uncomfortable. Mainly, the witness won't answer your question. And then you know, all right, I'm on to something. This is a topic the witness doesn't want to talk about. So how are you doing that digging? How are you figuring out what's going to make the other side uncomfortable during a deposition? Are you asking open-ended questions? Are you putting the exhibits up in front early on during the deposition to try and put some pressure? What's the style and approach there? I think there are two phases to almost every deposition. One's a discovery phase, and then another phase is to build your case. I start off generally with a discovery phase, which means what other witnesses do I need to learn about this case? What other documents are out there? What does this witness know? And ask a lot of open-ended questions. Who, what, when, why, where, and how? So those are the six starts to very open-ended questions that get you all this information. The second part of the deposition is how to build your case and actually also find out the weaknesses in your case. And that's very focused. And I've got documents. I've got the prior witness statements. I can tell you a little bit more about how I get ready for that. But that's a second part where it's very organized and I'm not going to leave the deposition until I get the answers to the questions I want. There's so many paths to take that. So I'm going to maybe start with the first thing that came to my mind. What is your typical strategy with when to start trying to pin down the deponent? Do you wait until the very end or are you kind of working that throughout the deposition? I like to be very efficient in my depositions, mainly because time's so valuable. Mm -hmm. The time in taking the deposition, all right, that's however many hours that is. The time in getting ready for the deposition, obviously. And then lastly, the time in reviewing this very, very long transcript. I hate doing that. I like to take shorter depositions. So with that, my general rule I'll spend the first hour, if it's a discovery uh, deposition that necessary, finding out about the witnesses that we just talked about, the documents and everything this witness knows that might lead me to more information. After that first break and we come back, I don't want to mess around. I want to get out of that deposition what I came for. I don't want to read it. I don't want to waste time that day uh, taking a longer deposition than necessary. Plus, and Jared, here's the key thing. When you ask those key questions right after a break, I mean, they go right to the heart of the matter. Is that opposing lawyer going to be to tell you, hey, Shane, let's take a break and then coach his witness during the break? Your answer is no. Well, we just took a break. So it's unreasonable to take a break after you've just had a break. So that excuse and that opportunity to coach, you have preempted by asking those important questions right after a break. And same for the witness. And now the witness knows I'm in here on my own. I don't have the help of the attorney. Mm -hmm. There's no break. And I'm going to need to answer these simple questions or there's, there's no way out. So I think that's a good time to do it. 
and it's efficient. And then you end the deposition and go on your way. So that's funny to me. You're, it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're the one who's like, hey guys, let's maybe go on a quick break, knowing that when you come back, you're about to come in with the hammer, so to speak. Yeah. So I don't know if I decide to start the break or they do, but at the time I agree with you. Yeah. You get the break. Maybe it's been 45 minutes. I kind of know how the discovery part's going to go. If, uh -huh. if it's only going to go 30 minutes, well, then you haven't planned it so well. And if the discovery part is not that much, I would just start with the important questions and do the discovery later. So maybe mm -hmm. I say you just had like five or 10 minutes of discovery questions. Well, Put that at the end of your deposition. Uh, swear in the witness. Uh, go over the couple of quick questions, which I always start a uh, witness with, and then mm -hmm. write to your important questions. I've tested that out, and you get really interesting responses to where, like, the first question after you've kind of laid the deposition foundation, so to speak, on everything that, you know, the ground rules is like, okay, why are you denying liability or something like that? You just come in without them having any type of warm up or, you know, comfort being built there. And then you frazzle them a little bit and you're right. They can't just immediately turn around and say, could we go on a break? I love that idea of just asking, what is your, why do you think you're not liable? And mm -hmm. you get the answer and they're squirming around, but they've got to answer it because there's no reason not to. Exactly. So you're not waiting until like six or seven hours into the deposition to be like, okay, now let me start getting a little bit more pointed with my questions that we were talking about four hours ago. I don't believe in that. I have spoken with a really good trial attorney who found that was the key to success and the way he succeeded. He'd wear the witness down they start saying yes kind of towards the end of the day. And then when they're starting to say yes, he would ask or slip in his important questions. That's not my personality style. I don't want to have to look at a seven hour or six hour transcript. And I don't think it really works because the witness by then uh, may be tired, slip, slips it in, but then the attorney on uh, his chance to ask questions can clear it up. I just don't think it works. And a lot more of the really good lawyers do it the way you and I just talked about, which is getting to the point, getting your questions and moving on. Okay. And then just some principles to give to the law venture community. What are some keys to a successful deposition? I came up with this acronym CROSS, which works both at trial and uh, particularly at depositions as well. I think it's a good framework for thinking about how to prepare for a deposition and what questions to ask. So the C of cross stands for credibility. As you're preparing, think about how you can challenge or undercut that witness's credibility, either through their bias for one side or the other. Maybe they work for the company that you're suing, or maybe they're an expert witness and they get all their money from one side. Maybe they have a criminal history that you can undercut uh, undercut their credibility. But more often, it's going to be something like they really uh, don't have as much knowledge to hurt you as they think they do. So maybe they uh, weren't uh, at the important meeting, something like that. Mm -hmm. So they undercut their credibility, mainly by showing uh, their bias or their lack of knowledge. Two is R, of course, restrict the damaging testimony. So this witness who is for the other side, assuming it's an adverse witness, you can limit the damaging testimony and think about how to do it. They can't be omniscient. So let's assume I was um, a plaintiff in an employee discrimination case, and that witness is saying, Shane, you're the worst employee I've ever had. Well, you could cross that uh, deponent with questions like, well, you think Shane's a bad employee, but you only supervised him for six months out of the six years he was at that company, right? Yes. There were other supervisors who supervised him, right? Yes, yes. And those supervisors supervisors gave him very good evaluations. Mm -hmm. And by asking questions like that, you're restricting this damaging testimony to a small time period and a small number of supervisors. In fact, this witness is the only supervisor who thought, the plaintiff was a bad employee. So we've got C, credibility, 
R, restrict the damaging testimony. O, the outrageous statement. Jared, at any deposition, almost guaranteed a witness is going to exaggerate or say something that is outrageous. And that's Mm -hmm. the kind of statement that you can use at mediation or later at trial to undercut their credibility. An outrageous statement is something that does not have the ring of truth to it. Uh, Bill Clinton had so many of those. Uh, (laughs) One of his famous ones was in a uh, grand jury testimony. He was asked a question. He said, well, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. When people heard it, just said, you know, that makes no sense. Uh You're kind of just splitting hairs that don't make a difference. Mm -hmm. So if you get a statement like that, you're golden. You don't have to prove to him, hey, President Clinton, we all know what the meaning of a word is, is, and you're getting a big uh, argument about it. He's made this outrageous statement that doesn't make sense. And now you've got something to use against an opponent later on. So we have credibility, restrict the damaging testimony, listen for that outrageous statement that you can get at the deposition. Then we have two S's to complete the acronym. The first S is prior inconsistent statements. Two things, before the deposition, gather all the statements, emails, uh, prior depositions, if they're an expert witness, et cetera. So you have these statements at the deposition. And I am hoping that that witness will say something at the deposition that's inconsistent with what he or she has already said. Mm -hmm. That undercuts their credibility. So I love it when they say, they embellish, they exaggerate, whatever, that's inconsistent with a prior statement. The last thing is the last S of this acronym CROSS, and that is to support your case. So let's use an expert witness as an example, right? They've been paid by the other side to destroy your case. Well, any expert has to at least agree agree to a few facts that support your case. So take this horrible witness and get them to at least support three things that no one in the world could disagree with. And that is at least one tool you can use if this hired expert is out there to destroy your case. We have attack the credibility, restrict the damaging testimony. Here, if they make an outrageous statement, hopefully they'll make a prior inconsistent statement where you can use that to impeach them at the deposition. And finally, at your deposition, see if there are ways you can get them to support your case. Hey, Mr. Witness, I, I know you think my company is the worst company in the world, but you at least agree these three things. Yeah. Whatever they are. That's golden. That's golden. So let's maybe chop it up a little bit and go a little bit deeper because some questions were popping up as you were going through. So with the R on restrict, it sounds like you're not shy with trying to elicit the bad facts, so to speak, so you can help size up the other side's position. I agree with that. So let's back up even further. If you decide to take a deposition, there is a danger that you are memorializing bad facts against your case. Mm. But we know at these important witnesses, you need to take their deposition. So once you're in the deposition, your goal is to get to the truth as much as you can. And if the truth turns out to be that your client has not been as forthcoming as they should have been. And you learn, oh my gosh, this witness really has a lot of bad facts against my case. Then you just settle the case and you've saved a lot of time because you moved on. I mean, the last thing, Jared, you want to do is get surprised at a mediation or trial if you put all this time into it. That, hey, the other side really does have a good case. But following up on your question, yeah, the bad question, bad answers don't bother me. I'm still going to try and take them and say, well, you think my client, the plaintiff is terrible. Let's at least uh, limit what you know about him or her to what's the truth. And Shane, for me personally, it's the unknown at trial or the, the facts that I haven't elicited that probably give me the most anxiety because if you're not prepared on that, you're going to have to think on the fly on how to handle it. And so if I haven't asked the right questions during the deposition, there's a chance I may be blindsided. So I guess, you know, that helps illustrate the importance of depositions. I agree completely. The the more you know, the better. And don't be afraid, as most of us are, 
of getting that bad answer in the deposition. It gives you time to fix it later. It lets you learn about the case, lets you learn about the witness. And the search for truth helps you find out, well, is this a really good case I've got or do I need to put my resources somewhere else? I guarantee you there's a lawyer watching who's like, yeah, I've had the situation where my client wasn't 100% upfront with me on what was happening. So uh, the deposition guys, for those that are watching, those can really help you. So let's transition to the outrageous statement because I really like that. In today's world where we're consumed or consuming Instagram reels, YouTube shorts, TikToks, and it's all like 60 second to 90 second little snippets of some powerful instances or conversations or topics, it sounds like we can cater to that type of environment at trial by pulling those outrageous statements in the deposition and plugging them in to trial to help, you know, keep the attention, but also to, you know, have those impactful moments. I agree. I think that's one of the keys to a deposition is just listening, hearing it, and just kind of do a little mental checklist. All right, that's one crazy statement I just heard. Oh, that's two. Now you've got two embellishments. Now we have a perfect memory, you know, the, th the third outrageous statement, whatever the category they fit into. And then you can uh, cut those out for not cut, but uh, display them on a PowerPoint at mediation. Mm -hmm. The question, the answer show, are you really relying on this witness to prove your case? Look at the three things he just said. And I don't think you can get more than three outrageous statements. You'll usually get one, maybe not two or three, but one's all you need because it destroys their credibility. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're looking for. And the outrageous statement could be somebody who just seems so biased yeah, that it, it just reveals itself in one answer. You go, all right, I got you. You're no longer credible. You're not the truth teller. I am. So I had a case on the plaintiff's side as a car wreck case of sorts. And I took a series of depositions to show that some of these witnesses were speculating on my client's speed. And, you know, I had basically a, it was a motion for summary judgment, which, which is very rare coming from the plaintiff's side. And I went to go argue it and to, and arguing it on my presentation, I had the greatest hits, basically. It was, you know, short little snippets from these depositions showing like, yeah, I'm speculating. Yeah, I'm not an expert. Yeah, I'm guessing about this. Yeah, I'm guessing about that. And the judge was really, really focused in on that to where, you know, they, I had to strike the balance of, I don't want it to feel like a Netflix documentary, but I also want the judge to get a sense of like, hey, what I'm telling you is, is accurate. There is speculating going on watch it for yourself. And so I think if you have that balance, it can be very powerful. I agree. And I like those short, simple questions you just recited to us. Those are perfect. And what you've proven is that this these this witness or these witnesses are guessing and speculating and, and really aren't knowledgeable mm -hmm. and trustworthy witnesses on what they claim they saw. Have you experienced from other lawyers like resistance to film depositions to be able to take these clips? No. I mean, once you've okay. noticed a videotape deposition, you have every right, if they meet evidentiary standards, which they should mm -hmm. under any circumstance, it's not a problem. So do it. Uh, if you can at all afford to pay for it, it will uh, return uh, the investment you make, whether it settles for a higher dollar amount of mediation or if you're on the defense side, it gets rid of a case. They are key to showing what this witness is really like. So a picture tells the story of a thousand words, a video clip does even more. So much better than, oh, here's a question and answer I asked and here's the transcript. And you don't know if the witness hemmed and hawed, waited a minute before they answered, if they were angry, if they were feigning mm -hmm. a lack of recollection, uh, looking at you incredulously when you asked it, all those subtle things that the video clearly picks up are lost in a bland transcript. Shane, I was heartbroken after a deposition of a defendant to where that it was a during COVID. So it was a Zoom deposition during, I think, like the early stages of doing Zoom depositions. And so I told the company that was 
doing the transcript. I was like, I also want a video recording as well. Okay, cool. And I'm going through this deposition and the deponent, the defendant in this situation, whenever I pull out the Texas driver safety handbook, I'm like, do you agree with this rule, this rule, this rule, this rule? And she realized, oh, some of these rules she had broken. And I'm pretty sure she didn't recognize that those were rules. And she, her, her answer, I think at some point was, don't I have to, don't I have to? <laughs> and then getting her to eventually say like, yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. Right, but her, her body language was what was so compelling because at some point she just starts doing this and she's just like, yes, <laughs> yes. And oh, wow. it was great, but you probably yeah. know where this story is going. Because I like reach out, I'm like, hey, can you send me the video portion? And it's like, oh, oops, we didn't have the video. And I was heartbroken, heartbroken. They ended up comping me the, the actual transcript as a result of it because I think they recognized that it, it was going to be important. But um, those videos, man, if you can get the right body language can be powerful. I agree, yes. Okay, so let's maybe transition to another topic because... You, you obviously have a lot of knowledge about a lot of different things and opening statements are what I'm most interested in, especially because I went on your website, winnetpersuasion.com, link down below to check it out. And one of your lessons that you have there is titled opening statements that win every time. That caught my attention. Opening statements are the most important part of a trial. And the reason for that is uh, there was a study done maybe about 30 years ago. So it's been out a while. And it found out that 80% of jurors make up their minds about a case after opening statements. So this idea that you're going to wait till closing argument to tie everything together and explain your case is just a myth that should no longer exist.